Welcome to the one within all to another episode of Interverse. I'm your host, Chance. Super stoked to be getting into this one today. We've got everybody's homie, aka Romy, the homie Romy, one <laughs> half of the dynamic duo of uh, Rising from the Ashes podcast. What an awesome guy. Incredible poet, musician, researcher, farmer. He does a little bit of everything and he does it all really well with style, with fun. Super excited to have him on for a full on presentation today. He's got slides, a PowerPoint. It is going to be huge. So that being said, your typical interverse listener out there, I know you guys are on the RSS feed, just checking out the audio version of the show. We're going to do our best to describe what we see that Romy is sharing, but you're going to get the maximum experience out of this particular episode. If you go find the YouTube Rockfin Odyssey bit shoot, one of those places, my Patreon and get the video version of this podcast. We're making all the technology work in our favor today. And this conversation is actually about that very thing. A concept Romy is bringing to the table. Very original idea here. Antiquated transhumanism. So the history of technological assistance to get lifted out of your base state of consciousness <laughs> into some other realm. <laughs> Whether or not this is good or if it's just as uh, weird and uh, uncomfortable as the modern versions of transhumanism, or maybe some of both, we will be deciding as we go. It's up to you paying attention out there what you think of it, but it's going to be fascinating nonetheless. Really excited to learn. I know that our boy has been working on the information for quite some time. So check out the episode description for links to Rising from the Ashes, the excellent podcast that Romy's a part of. Also, we had him on a Vibrant maybe a month ago, and that was a lot of fun. Sometimes drops in with us and weaving spiders. But dude, got to say, one of the funnest people to be around, <laughs> at least digitally. Aww. Can't wait to hang out in real life. <laughs> Huge love for this dude, homie Romy. Can't wait to get into his presentation. So welcome to Interverse, my buddy. What's going on? What's good? Oh, man. Uh, uh, thank you for that. I mean, well, it's funny. Today's like straight up the, the full moon. Uh, like it's it's happening this evening. So and there's like an good. eclipse and stuff. And it's eclipse and it's Mercury Gatorade. So I mean, full moon in your sign, right? It's in Scorp, right? It's in Scorp, which is nuts. I don't even know. Like life is just so crazy. I, I got so we were going to do this, you know, yesterday or a couple of days ago. And it's just like through just the natural happenstance of, I guess what I, I another thing I, I'm, I'm working on is called the cosmic code. What the fuck is the cosmic code? Exactly. What is it? No one knows, but it is, there's some sort of cosmic code. And, uh, and yeah, so I guess now we're here doing it on the full moon, which is even better. I think so. Big vibes right now. Big vibes right now. I think there's actually the second reschedule. We had it even like a month earlier, but that didn't quite flow. But this is the perfect time. I'm ready to learn. I'm super excited. And it's really like part one of what will be a future episode that we continue on it. So did I do it justice describing what you're here to tell us about antiquated transhumanism? Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Did Thank you for that. You did a great job. And um, it's, I mean, it's such a, for me, it's a vast concept. So like trying to even just put it into words is, is really been the biggest struggle and, and work of my life uh, as of late. So, you know, just, just trying to, cause every time I, I'll like get up to do more research and get on and start adding slides and editing stuff and moving slides. I'm like, this doesn't work anymore. This do it's completely irrelevant information. Now, you know, this needs to go in here and, it's it, there's just it's it's a constant flux of um, of understanding and I think it's only going to get more refined. So I, honestly, at this point, and that's why I was really glad to get on with you and your understanding of the the auric fields and consciousness in general, because you know if you listen to our FTA our podcast, you know I, I we talk to a lot of authors and stuff, you know, going into history because we love ancient history. It's really, we started it, trying to be an ancient history show and then we end up diving into like occult stuff too, obviously, because everything's a cult, but everything's constant. I feel you, dude. I was just trying <laughs> to have a good time and like talk about music festivals and look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> It's such a slippery slope. It's like it's covered in just hot butter. But hey, who doesn't love it? 
uh, butter, maybe lipids. More butter, go. more better. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so I have a, I have a like a kind of like a precursor misnomer piece that I write here for when we're doing this presentation, and uh, I'm just gonna give it a go. Okay, antiquated transhumanism. You know, as a conscious existing being, we're actually pretty simple. Yet the muck in our minds can cloud up the streamlined connection to our resonating frequency that we naturally attune to. Either by the society we choose to live in or the choices we make, speaking in the modern reality and seemingly almost any time period, we're limited by our technology. Or we're told so. And the argument being presented here uh, is that the ancestral line that we've been fed through history is in and out of complete truth, like a sine wave pulsing over and under a streamline of fictitious understanding of time. And time itself is not linear, thus it does grow and evolve. And the invention of time reading devices such as dials, swatches, clocks, show us that by their cylindrical design. And so this theorem consists of a broad intuitive understanding and a willingness to be open that our planet, this realm, and our bodies are, are electrically attuned and attached to the source field. It's this thick goop that allows us to connect when the operator of our conductive bodies is ready to turn on and tune in. And at the same time, I want to paint a visual of how this idea can be viewed from an aerial position, kind of similar to a style of simulation theory. Thus, I don't completely condone to that. <clears throat> I feel like it's obviously more complex. Uh, but Earth is like a vessel. Uh, in a lab and sterilized and controlled environment. And we are like the electrons within the lipid solution, controlling the charge, whether it's very high or very low, just like the ebbs and the flows, it allows vibrational movement to be essentially attuned to the observer or the controller of the experiment. Okay, now back to the good stuff here. We're living in a very electrical environment, and this general understanding is not well adept by our mainstream society, but known in the areas of serious esoteric science, and potentially for Centurion. Somewhere along the line, seemingly between the 14th and 19th centuries, the biggest cover-up of history through the invention of the alphabet, as we know it, modern English and modern science. Bam. <laughs> man, uh, you've got a real good way with words, man. Whether it's poetic or prosaic, you definitely paint a picture. And uh, shoot, so that's that part about the history being a sine wave slipping in and out of the frequency of accuracy and truth. That is a really cool concept. And that's part of what makes all this so tricky because you have one camera that's like, okay. Let's go with the historical narrative. What does it tell us? And then there's the other camp that's like, throw it all out. But really, it's somewhere in this weird concoction, blending it all together. Especially when you throw the internet in it. Especially when you throw the internet in it. <laughs> throw a little internet in and <laughs> it gets wacky. That's where we're at, man. You know, and so we're living in this very interesting time. Uh, where it's almost like, you know, I almost do want to throw everything out because it's like, I, I can't even, I don't even know if I can trust any of the information that I find on internet. That's why I'm obsessed with, with books. Um, you know, and, but it's like, you know, I also want to get my body covered in tattoos and I want every book in the world and also every piece of guitar equipment. But it's like, I don't have that much money, you know, <laughs> like I just, I, we are limited, you know? And so, uh, but we're not at the same time, you know, I think the limitations, Those limitations are what let us make a work of art out of our life. You know, if you just threw every color of paint on the canvas and all the paint you had and blah, blah, blah. I mean, some people make art that way, but <laughs> It's the limitations that form the boundaries and and the decision points, the choices that create the real uniqueness out of our life masterpiece. And I'm totally with you, man. Totally with you. Uh, the the books are super helpful right now. And the more that I can learn about the astro theology side, that's what I'm really fascinated in mm -hmm. about history. The current conundrum I'm on is like, okay, how much of history was actually just written 
made up to sound and look like sky clock, but just sneaky enough of an encoding so that you don't know that it's actually just mythology told to you as history. Or does history actually play out the pattern of sky clock symbolically? And that's why we have the sky clock that we have. And that's where we got those symbols. Which is it? Like, <laughs> does history just do that? Do people do important lives that are really tapped into source just play the exact hero's journey? Or are we applying that hero's journey to historical people and to empires and stories as a way to like encode it with something that makes it hold on to information that the sages want society to keep, but only want the, you know, initiated to actually be able to read? Is it one or the other, or is it a mix of both? So, so hard to know. Well, you know, I, I, I love that by the way, it's beautiful. And, and kind of what I'm getting from that and how I guess I would answer that is, you know, like the, the constellations or, you know, our, our, our zodiacal signs is, is like a map, um, or, or diagrams, equations to, um, electrical, uh, correspondences and so it's like you know you have a um a diagram you know where all your wires are getting connected in order to make this this motor work right or something like that and in order it has to run through these certain parameters and these certain wires in order to have the electrical response and i feel like it's 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 just a, it's this huge template because it, it does get repeated time and time again you you know we find ourselves in in cycles um and they correspond to these very ancient cycles and it's like that hasn't changed you know it's it's been seemingly the same following the same template and the same rules so you know i think those those and um I think those alchemical writings, you know, that, that have a lot of like astro theological ties or these old biblical writings or, or religious text. I think what they were doing is understanding, just starting to understand the, you know, the, the correspondences between the cosmos and here and the electrical play in between them both. And then our consciousness is like the communicator between both of those, you know, uh, both of the physical plane and then the cosmic plane, you know, it's like that lipid solution, you know, that's, that is there. Our consciousness is able to communicate between both of them. And it's, it's, it's a mind altering, but the, those just even knowing the sky clock stuff and, and all of that is just, it's really a really big piece of the puzzle and, and, you know, paying attention to dreams also, you know, is obviously up there with that as well. Big time, man. I love what you said about our consciousness being the bridge between the inner outer and that electrical interplay. And uh, one thing that fascinates me too, that I remember, and then I kind of forget about it because it's so out there, but then <laughs> somebody like brings it to my attention that, Hey, this happened to me too. And I'm like, Oh, okay. I keep hearing about this happening to people. And it's even kind of happened to me in a less direct way, but multiple times, which is that there's this being that the uh, either self-initiated or someone that just like stumbles into mysticism. There's this being that starts like helping them out and guiding them through the process. And it shows up and he's like, hello, I'm Thoth or I'm Hermes or I'm Mercury or I'm Odin or I'm Jesus Christ. And person after person, I read their book or I talk to them and they tell me, yeah, I met Hermes. Yeah. I met Thoth. It's different. They, they get a different flavor of the character, but is that, what's just clicking in my mind is maybe that is a, a mirror of the consciousness of the individual who's actually trying to cross the border, cross the boundary. And so that's why the, the thought shows up, but it's really just them and they're looking in the mirror <laughs> and they're guided, they're self guiding, you know, I don't know, yeah, but I love that. That's, so I mean, that's, it is wild and it's a beautiful, beautiful, wild, Something that you just stop, remind me of thought, 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 that beautiful, beautiful creature that it, he is kind of, you know, he is Jesus, right? Hermes is Jesus and, uh, you know, all, all of that good stuff. The light bearer, you know, bringing the light, you know, the light is consciousness, you know, your consciousness is pure, pure white light. And so, um, you know, he, he appears to you in that, but also, you know, it's, there's this um archetype of the of the leader 
um, like Katakatl, Hermes, Jesus, they're these leaders and people follow them. You know, like you're saying, they transport the consciousness and it's like the flood or the deluge can be taken physically, but it can also be taken consciously as well. You know, there's a, and, and, and the arcs, you know, to float on the waters of the consciousness or, you know, to, to follow Jesus, you know, through the consciousness to go, uh, to, and to find the lands, you know, to escape Atlantis or the physical plane to go up to the heightened, uh, areas of consciousness just to come back down because I believe in reincarnation fully. And then, so you go up, you come back down and then you learn these different lessons and it's just, it's, Look at it it's like just, a book. You like you have a book that you love that's an, a novel and it's like your favorite story. But yeah, you want to read it again, but reading it right after you just read it isn't as enjoyable as waiting a few years. So you kind of forgot <laughs> what happened and then you read it again. I feel like that's what we're doing. We're just like, oh, I, I'm remembering. Oh, I remember this. Oh, yeah, I've done this. But you waited long enough that it was totally forgotten before you came back to that stage of the the eternal return, if you will. And that we got to get into your slides because this is so okay. easy to just get into shit. But I want to add to it that uh, <laughs> that whole flood, you're so right that that is symbolic both in the mind and in the physical realm. It seems to have evidence for both. I mean, just the very fact that we are either at the tail end of or have just come out of the age of Pisces and you have mm -hmm. that Vatican controlling the whole world and their whole fish symbolism. The deluge in that sense is literally the delusion, you know, Yeah, <laughs> people are yeah. just delusional about <laughs> like this, idea, this tower of Babel experience of my God, not your God or my pantheon, not your pantheon and totally missing the truth. That's right in front of our face the whole time that, yo, it's the same exact son of God, son, God, hero's journey for all of us. And we just decided that. We would not pay attention to how similar our languages were and how similar the concepts were and just pretend like, oh, this is different and you bad, mine good. And that's the delusion. That's the real, yeah. that's the deluge on the consciousness level. <sighs> it's been a long time, man. A long, long working to try to get our, our, our psyches um, disbruised. Um, but, you know, if, if, if we are coming out of the age of Pisces and the, the water bearer, you know, we're going into the Aquarius age where they're pouring us out of the pot. We're not going to be just completely drowning in the water anymore. It's our time to get a little bit of fresh air. Um, you know, we're, we're, and, and we have pure intentions and we can really, truly, you know, bring the, bring the full electrical charge and resonance of people's spirits back. And we're going to have, we're going to have this earth just vibing at, at the utmost high. Electroquarius. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's that's an air sign. Man, People man. need to get their head out from under the water of yeah. Pisces, that's for sure. Yeah. Pisces is too dreamy, okay? And the, dream, <laughs> the dreams are in the, the hands of these rich fucks, and that's not cool. Yeah, it's deep, it's poetic, it's artsy, but also, like, it can be delusional, big time. Yeah. Self-deceptive is in there. Oof. All right, man, let's do it. I Let's do it. Antiqui here. Antiquated transhumanism. And then the resonance architecture is more the part two that we'll probably be on next time that we have you on, right? Yes. Yes. Which they is a lot. Other. It's a lot more fun. <laughs> that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one is more of just like looking at like, you know, the old royal crowns and scepters and everything. And um, which is still really fun and cool. And uh, but the, the, the arch architecture is like, that's like, you know, we got to save that the fun stuff for the end, right? We got to get through the, the crazy shit first. Um, so here's a quote, another misnomer quote I like to start off with uh, before we get too deep in the slides. Um, I like to say that the motives of the people who pull the strings haven't changed from the days of Plato, in the cave allegory, to the merging and the hijacking of the cult of Isis into what we know now as the monotheistic Christianity. So that is why I really call this antiquated transhumanism. And again, I don't think it's all negative. I think in and of itself, it's magic. And there are different shades of that practice. And it's up to you what you choose to tap into.
Okay. So we're just going to start off by talking about what is transhumanism, um, you know, in the, in the modern sense. So transhumanism is a movement that aims to use technology to enhance human intellect, physiology, and psychological abilities. This can be anything from brain implants to bionic eyes, stem cell tech, and exoskeleton body suits. Transhumanism is a class of philosophies of life that seek the continuation and acceleration of the human or of the evolution of intelligent life beyond its currently human form and human limitations by means of science and technology guided by life promoting principles and values. That was a quote from Max Moore. Modern transhumanists forgot the life promoting part. <laughs> they left that out. Yeah, well, the, I think that I, I don't know like what their dictionary looks like, but they might have a different, uh, completely different dictionary. This is Max Moore, by the way. I thought I would put his, his this smug mug on here just so you can look at his, his look at his eyes, and you're just like, yeah, he's like the bad guy in a movie. Yeah. Oh, hmm. <laughs> interesting. I mean, he's yeah. got like a Marvel name, and you know, there's a alliteration in his name, Max Moore. Yeah, I mean, look, we could, we could probably 13, break 13. this down. Yeah, exa exactly. Thank you, thank you. And even the yes. name sounds like bullshit. I mean, Max and Moore, you're literally like, it's two words that are meaning almost the same thing. <laughs> you know, we, we got Max out these humans. They're going to be more advanced. Max Moore. <laughs> <laughs> what I can't, word. dude. Oh, that is Lynn just, and he's a redhead, which is awesome. I love redheads. Anyways, uh, the world is evolving positively due to, this is a quote, by the way, for people that are just listening, uh, this is from, from a website. This is not my words at all. This is fucking hilarious. The world is evolving positively due to transhumanism, tech, and science. I believe it will continue to evolve into a place where living standards and the happiness of all people sharply rise as a result. In the future, I think there will be more interconnectedness than ever before. While I'm a big fan of the individual and their rights, such interconnectedness due to a digital culture will bring us all closer, possibly in ways we couldn't imagine. Eventually, advancements in technology such as widespread chip implants, virtual currencies, and brain weaving devices, brain, <laughs> brain wave reading devices, which already exist, will force issues of equality and universality across all communities and borders. Globalization will not just be a slow jog, but become a full sprint. That's from extremetech.com. And that was written in, I think it was like 2011. Yeah, it's too bad that equality can only be created by bringing everyone down. You can't bring everyone up. <laughs> There's only equality in misery in terms of what a government can create. <laughs> yeah, you have to flatten it, right? You have to just smush the it. the curve. Yeah, yeah. ooh, let's, let's, let's not, yeah, let's build it up. There'll be too many gaps. God, and here's some, some art. A lot of these slides are just art, and so I just, we can just look at art, you know. Um, this is... Um, there's a guy with a robot arm attached to his wrist, so he's basically yeah. got three hands. Yeah, that he's like, look, I can write this word faster. It's like, okay, you write one word with three arms. It doesn't make Your any handwriting sense. looks like shit. It also looks like <laughs> shit. This guy, there was somebody at this uh, healing arts fair that I went to today that was like reading your soul based on your handwriting. It was like an astrologer, but they would just check out your handwriting instead of uh, your chart. <laughs> So I wonder what they'd say about the, the robot hand. <laughs> what it's astro what it's uh, handwriting means about its soul. He's like, he's like, this is a, uh, I don't know. I had, I had, I had something waiting for that, but no, I don't. Anyways, one of my main issues with this movement isn't the cohesion and relationship of human to technology, but my issue is simply the merging of human and technology. It's a great point because I mean, even that's even a little blurry because uh, somebody that needs a prosthetic yeah. leg, that's transhumanism, yeah. but I'm not going to yeah. be like, at least by ba most basic definition, but I'm not going to tell someone they can't improve the quality of their life that way. It's just when the, the life promoting thing is misunderstood or li mm -hmm. live is inverted and becomes evil. You mm -hmm. know, when the, Oh, I'm all for the individual, but we just can't afford that anymore because we're too close with the digital world. 
Yeah. That's where you lose me individual because that's not how it works. It, that's not how universe works. There's the universal ether. And then there's our bodies that are a vessel that contain the ether, but they're, they're individual. Uh, so we have to continue to whatever we, we're doing. If it doesn't continue to um, allow that dynamic of an, a perfectly unique individual that is made up of the stuff of the all, then we're no longer doing what life does and what nature does. We're doing something inverse. And and it's it the thing is with like the whole prosthetic leg and you know like those types of operations. That's how they will always advertise it. That's how they'll play it on commercials on public television. You know, if they were to say, "Hey, you know, like, you know, like a Neuralink, for instance," you know, like it's they're, they're you know they're going to advertise it in a way that's going to help grandma, grandma, you know, and the babies, right? And then. They're not going to put, you know, all of the massive amounts of, uh, you know, data mining that's going on or, you know, the fact that they could like, you know, just release some uh, too much of an electrical charge and completely shut off, you know, your body and, and cause you to have, you know, seizures in the middle of the night without you even knowing, thinking you're having nightmares or some shit, you know, like they're going to advertise it as that really clean way, just like how they did with 5G and stuff you know uh which i i still go back and forth on all the time but like i'm pretty sure it's not good but um, <laughs> i'm pretty sure it's not good <laughs> pretty sure i'm thinking it's of futurama good. the episode of futurama where they like beam commercials into someone's dreams <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, you're like in the middle of a dream and then it's like brought to you by coca-cola in the dream you drink a coke oh, and you know it like you don't normally drink it's coke so bad. it's so bad like i so bad i mean it's so bad like these things i mean we've all had I, can we, can we just, I just want to ask you what your most recent vivid dream was. If you, if you don't mind sharing. I was driving hover motorcycles with some friends through a gigantic mansion that was like an infinite labyrinth. And we were like flying from room to room. It was sort of like a chase scene. I can't remember if we were chasing the other hover motorcycles or they were chasing us. I think we were the running away ones, but we were, I was doing like badass Mario Kart power slides around 90 <laughs> degree turns and I don't know. That's all I remember. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I love dreams. I love dreams. I had, I had one the other night. I actually related to a scooter kind of, there was a John good. So it was like the, the end of the world was coming and I knew it cause I was working for basically the entire town it was apocalyptic and I had to, I was a woman and I had to, uh, I was a beautiful woman, by the way. Uh, I had to work for the like local mobsters, you know, just to like get food and whatnot. And then the, the head honcho was John Goodman. And like, I heard him over saying that, uh, that the, you know, the apocalypse was literally coming and he was going to be, you know, one of the horsemen basically of it. And he was going to run the apocalypse. And so everybody that worked for him was going to be fine. And I was like, Oh God, I have to, I have to, vanquish myself anyway so i but then it turned from like a high school into a mall and so i was like i knew where this best buy was and the best buy was going to have an electric scooter and that but the scooter turned into a gun and i turned this tiny little gun into my pocket and started trying to run away and i had to get on all fours because that was like faster for me but then i ended up turning around and then shooting a bunch of people <laughs> that were for this crazy son of a bitch. And then I turned back into a dude and uh, then I woke up and it was really weird. <laughs> yeah. And see, that's how, I mean, the, the technology is so integrated into our existence that both of us had <laughs> dreams that involved some technology. Yes, exact. That's what, see, that's what makes me think about, this um inevitability on the path of transhumanism because it seems like through this evolution um this technological evolution you know with the, the consciousness evolution through centuries is that you know what we've created here is is absolutely inevitable just because if you look at the power um uh, that is b and their motives throughout you know the centuries it has led us to exactly to where we are. You know, it's, there's, there's been nothing done to really stop that, you know, there, because I, I think it's the ultimate, uh, motive is, is to, uh, is the portal jump probably, you know, and, and to control the time portals for sure. 
Um, if there are such things, if there are such things, yeah, exactly. I, you know, since quantum computing came about, uh, and quantum technology, that's really when things just got incredibly ramped up. I mean, you, yeah, you know, I was just talking about this today with someone though, when they put the word quantum in front of something, they might as well just be saying magic computers, magic technology. Because it's like, what does quantum even mean in terms of a technology? It's never a consistent thing. The best case scenario in terms of like a new ager that calls their thing quantum is they're trying to convey that whatever it is, usually a device, has the ability to further amplify the power of their wielder's intentions more than mm -hmm. intention is normally powerful. But intention is yes. already really powerful. Like I want to say here that how much of our technology is actually just a plagiarization of abilities humans have would have naturally. I asked this question because of the dream thing. Almost every dream I have, I'm flying in some way. I have amazing mobility and speed and usually can fly to, to a degree. And some of the dreams I'm actually just able to fly. And that's the story. Other dreams I'm Spider-Man web swinging around and that's why I'm flying, but it's functionally the same. And then there's dreams like last night where I think that I'm on a hover hovering motorcycle, but it's just like flying. Mm -hmm. So the, the experience is the same thing. The functionality of what I'm doing is just a function of consciousness. Consciousness is free. Freedom is what spirit is innately. And when we're talking about this age progression thing, we, we brought up age of Pisces, right? Well, what's before mm -hmm. that is the age of Aries. It goes backwards, oddly mm -hmm. enough. So the age of Aries would be like the pinnacle of the whole thing. So when, you know, later someday when we're talking about resonance architecture, or maybe some of the things we're going to discuss right now that is so advanced, but so simple and so tapped into just mm -hmm. the innate power of the human and the wielder. And it's just like an electricity amplifier that is seamless and barely invasive at all. And just artistic mm -hmm. and perfect. That mm -hmm. makes sense as an age of Aries thing, right? It's the pinnacle of the development. Yeah. It's really about the, the, the most high in the individual and the, uh, the out external expression of it is not in any way diminishing the power of the most high of the individual, if that makes sense. And then you get into, so why would it go backwards? I'm just not realizing because you finished the game, <laughs> you beat the game. So now you start back on level one. So that's why the ages would progress backwards as opposed to the direction that life in nature goes uh, through the Zodiac and the sun's movement through it. Right. So you got to have counter weird. rotation. You have to, in order to oh, have yeah, that uh, too. energy. So Pisces would be like, it makes sense that you, you get dark ages and basically no technology and a lack of your spiritual component. Mm -hmm. And then the next phase would be a technological replacement or crutch or prosthetic for what could be innate spiritual abilities. So Aquarius is going to be an improvement over Pisces in that sense. But yes. maybe we shouldn't take our, our eyes off the prize of like, all of this is just a, an expression of what human beings actually as it, you know, infinite sparks of the divine that we are ought to be able to, in some capacity, manifest, generate, create innately through our will. And it could be a long road to get back to there, like thousands and thousands of years. <laughs> but I don't see why an individual couldn't progress through their procession individually faster. It's just like maybe it'll never adopt to the whole society until it's the right age. But why couldn't we ourselves learn and, uh, and just be in whatever phase of development that we're actually in as a spirit. I don't know. That was kind of a long rant, but that's what I'm thinking about. <laughs> well, I love it. Well, we are definitely definitely like you kind of blew my cat back a little bit there talking about going back to the age of Aries and something that's going to come up soon in these slides here, um, which will absolutely correlate to that, which actually kind of might make sense to put a chronological timestamp onto a lot of this. Um, a lot, a lot of the beginnings of this type of technology, maybe the age of, uh, of when a lot of it was really truly created and understood. And then everything in the age of Pisces, you know, here's something else too with the age of Pisces is to water things down. And that's maybe why we have such a large watering down of our history. Um, 
and you know watering down of the cathedrals right like just by building a bunch of shitty cheap you know neo renaissance architectures to water down the true depth and understanding and the power and the spiritual power of it um you know water is a really great thing but also you know you know it's just like you're making a great soup that's going to taste amazing but if you add too much water it down it's just a watery soup now you know so i think that's kind of happened um because there's like we talked about earlier the sine wave of history in and out of lies and in and out of truth it's <laughs> where all the creation stories begin too though it's all water and then mm -hmm. something is created out of that primordial water so I mean, mythologically, it makes sense to restart our cycle from that point of being watered down. It all it all comes back to water, too, right? Doesn't it? Like, it, you know, the resonance architecture is really water focused. Very much so. Very much so. Uh, yeah, like uh, basically all of it. Yeah, you, you absolutely have to have it. And I was talking to LC the other day, um, you know, about these antiquated buildings sorry this is that side rant i realized i had to pause there for a second thing i'm like is this relevant and i'm like fuck it i'm just gonna keep going but it, whatever <laughs> just second guessing my things while i'm saying on a live podcast whatever uh sorry bud um anyways is that like i'm i was like should we should we uh you know i'm like i'm focusing a lot on the spires and i i can't find any good pictures or any literature of what the fuck is really inside the mechanisms of the spires because that's what's really fascinating to me i've tried to sneak up in the cathedrals you know and i've tried to sneak into these buildings but it's just so hard you know to get up there uh, like no, i think it's ask removed, anybody who's like uh, oh the yeah you know it might might fucking be well a lot of the you know it's interesting enough i know we're not on the architecture piece but the bells right like there's the bells have all been removed from all the bell towers. And so there's no reason for anybody to go up there, right? If there's no bells, like no one needs to, you know, make sure there's nothing clogged, right? They don't need to check the mechanics of it or anything. Also, obviously they're not going to use the function of resonating and communicating through the resonance and, you know, vibrating the ley lines across the lands because they were all connected through ley lines and, and these bells would resonate and they would communicate with each other and they would all ring at the same time when the sun hits a certain area, you know, then the sun goes through that certain you know either east west or north facing uh you know rose window is and it's like there's it's it's a huge watering down and this is why to me this is some of the my most important work and it's really fascinating to me is because every time i look more into this stuff you know either whether this or the transhumanism part the antiquated transhumanism part or the resonant architecture is that the the fact that they're covering that up in the real function and the real history of consciousness and magic and the realm and electricity and physics and esoterica and occult it just it all goes back to the same type of like what are these buildings what are these tools what are we capable of and where do we come from and so you know it's there's there's so but i i feel like we're getting actually kind of close to some answers and it it's it's kind of crazy because I, I there's definitely a time when I didn't think we were going to ever see anything in our in our life. Um, what we consider an answer. But I don't know, man, I, I'm kind of getting hopeful a little bit. What, what about you? Uh, I look at it like we're in we're in infinity. We are infinity. So as far as we want to go towards the pursuit of answers. It all depends on whether or not we're asking the right questions. And if we keep asking the right questions, we're going to get answers. And then those answers are going to help us ask the next right question. And it's just <laughs> like electricity. It's just like the branches of a tree. The quest with your eye on asking as king, you are going to continue yes. seeking thou shall find, but it never ends. Like, so it's not like we're going to get the ultimate answers. We're just going to keep exploring no, 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 what yeah. we are and our potential. And it's going to get bigger and bigger as long as we don't get scared and quit going. But it's mm -hmm. like that question has an answer or, you know, and then that answer has two new questions and it branches off just like a tree is growing or just like lightning bolts hit. Like you have that dendritic, the veins in your body, asking questions, finding answers, getting new questions. It, it expands just like that. So the questions are a fuel. 
they're literally fuel. And as long as you don't stop and go, this is the answer and no longer question, you won't stagnate. You keep flowing. Yeah. And that's why I like to keep my expectations really low, uh, which isn't hard these days, but uh, keep my expectations low. And then also I'm like one of the easiest people to like mind blow. Like I just like, we'll learn anything and I'll be like, Oh my God, that's crazy. So you got to keep the the stoke alive within yourself. You know, that's a really good aspect of it. Very important. Keep the stoke alive within your own. You stay know. stoked my friends i'm so totally stoked it. yeah all right we're back onto the slides okay we're back what? onto the slides all right here we go <laughs> all right what is humanism we've all heard of humanism or, or maybe um despite its simplistic name it's a complex history and held at a high regard since its dawning in the 14th century essentially it's a philosophy striving to op and optimize the human intellect Though this is good in theory, eventually the concept dwindled from being available for the layman's and eventually was set aside for the initiated. The concept itself was incredibly fully transmuted into what we call transhumanism. And then I have just a serp here from uh, about Renaissance humanism uh, from classical antiquity. And it's not really super relevant, but here we go. Um, from crowns and coronets to Neuralink and nanotech. This is going to be a slam dunk weave. <laughs> Crown. Dun, 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 dun. So a lot of times crowns, you know, here's the thing, everybody. Why it's so crazy and it blew my mind is because when you when you look at royal crowns, they are in every country, in every culture, in every religion. They are everywhere. It wasn't just the royal jewels of of England, right, or even just Northern Europe or anything. It, in Germany, it was is everywhere, and they actually started, you know, way back in Egypt, right. So the concept of the crown. Hey. Yeah, so you, I think, I mean, there's so much to it. I don't want to jump in in front of your weave. You got to keep going, but no, you please Royal crown, is like. one, Royal crown is 27 in Gematria, which is the same as like Mercury and Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And here you have the Hermes staff. You got what a triple crown right here, or no, I guess you got a quad. Uh, let's see. Was one, two, three, four. I'm trying to count. There's always chakra points. There's either sevens, which correlate to the planets, which correlate to the chakras. So anytime in this stuff, when you guys see colors, they're going to correlate alchemically to the, the chakras of the planets, which are the same thing. So, you know, um, and, and yeah, like I, I love alchemical art. And so I tried to flood this thing with as much alchemical art as I could. You know, and this is classic alchemical. You're having so much, you know, of, of the hermetic principles within this. This is all hermetic and um, principle art. And uh, yeah, I mean, we could count these stars up here. There's so much. Every piece of hermetic art you guys ever look at um, is alchemical and it has so much symbolization to be broken down. I mean, that's not what I'm here to do today. I'm here to get across another concept. But the crown generally is what? I'm sorry. Also, these a lot of these pictures are pretty grainy. So anyone has a problem, you know, you can fuck off. But uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, why don't you fuck off? Because you are the one who just brought up a problem with it. It's obviously fine. Oh, OK. All right, all right. <laughs> You're Thank good, you man. Don't no okay. No disclaimers needed. You're crushing. Sweet. OK, so the crown is generally um, told to us in, in, in modern history. Uh, as it's a symbol of power, right? Political power. Well, the problem with that is, is that uh, the power of the quotes royal back in the antiquated days were not all for the lust of the political regime, but more for the addiction to the etherical vibration, the occult, the magic, the resonant with and like a god to resonate with the gods and like a god. Which is why the books were always in such a code and the secrets were in fact in the truest form, esoteric. Once the download started to come in while wearing crowns, it 
It was like a drug or finding that secret door to an enchanted world that's described in fairy tales and Oz. It's this technicolor existence to the beige reality. Not that this life is actually beige, but the frail veil that is between us and our eyes uh, and what might be considered God, ecstasy. It's crown. I want to get in there. Let me get in there one more time. Like, yeah. okay, oh, so yeah. I've never thought about what it would be like to wear a full on golden tiara with gems and jewels all encrusted in it. But I do know that like right now I'm wearing a, a pretty large wire wrap that has got an aura quartz and a moldavite. It's wrapped in silver. And this thing is way smaller than a crown and it isn't even on my head. <laughs> and I like when I first started wearing this years ago, uh, if I wore it for an entire day, my chest would hurt and be sore, not, not super painful, but be sore. Like I just did a workout. Like it was so much energy and it yeah. still is. It's really intense. And like, without digressing too much into the feel of just this one thing, I know for sure that wearing metals and gems and crystals has an effect. So like, I never thought of the crown as being an intoxicating thing to wear, but I'm sure that that would be like quite a power trip. A head change. And that's, it's exactly what it is. And, 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 you know, there's, there's more than just a crown and we'll get, we'll get to them. And that's exactly what creates this, you know, the symbol of power, the Royal or what being a Royal really was. It wasn't anything about political power. It, I mean, political power was just there because of that. Um, but because of, of understanding the secret sciences, that's exactly, um, how and why they knew about consciousness and they knew about these ancient Vedic texts, you know? Yeah. And so ancient Egypt, which is a template for a lot of, that came after and it itself mm -hmm. isn't the original, but it maybe is a descendant from the Atlantean or Hyperborean yes. Egypt, their Pharaohs, their King, they were not originally some bloodline thing passed from father to son. It was one of the most learned and highest ranking priests. The other priests would, get together and decide which one amongst them would be the next Pharaoh. And then there's a more complicated than that. The Royal or the, uh, the priestesses had to decide like, you know, basically the, uh, the daughter of the previous Pharaoh would be like also a priestess. And if she wasn't willing to marry the priest that they offered as the new Pharaoh, then he wouldn't be allowed. So it was really a female Illuminati type system. Mm -hmm. I think that has continued in the shadows up to this mm -hmm. day. That the Cult female is, is the, behind every great man is a <laughs> secret, more powerful woman. But that's another conversation. The point is that like it was an initiated class that was taking the, the throne. It wasn't ever an, originally in a lot of the societies that later monarchies are still a, modeled after a, esoterically, maybe not exoterically, but esoterically still modeled after that. It was all for a priest class that was in power. For sure. Undoubtedly. Yeah. I mean, and you have to have the marriage of the two. That's the hermetic principle, you know, and that a lot of those, those hermetics tie into each other. But the ultimate hermetic principle is androgyny. In the end, the marriage complete cohesion uh, or the philosopher's stone, which is like the marriage of both in the same body. And yeah, I mean, it's just... <laughs> Uh, it's so deep. It's so deep. Sorry. Sometimes I, it just, I, I, I want to say things, but then I'm also like, you know, my, my soul is just like trying to breathe also, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> oh, talking is, is a thing. Anyway, significant symbol of power. Okay. Power, electricity. That's a whole other realm of, of what I'm trying to tie into what consciousness is. Um, and so when they talk about, you know, the crown being a symbol of power. Well, it is, it is a symbol of power. It is a symbol of electricity. It's a symbol of the vibration that is God. Um, it's, it's from the rudimentary diadem or the diadem, which is just like a headband or something, you know, on your head. And, and that has a deeper meaning too, which I got a, a, a little usurped on later. But um, astrologically speaking, the crown was referenced to the stars in the sky and the zodiac wheel. Um, to wear this crown is to be the center of divine knowledge. His mind understands the cosmic laws and brings them to earth. His rule is divine.
So that again is, is talking about this, you know, to enhance your vibration um, and to have the intention of the vibration come from understanding astrotheology or understanding the titans in the sky and the electrical connection between uh, uh, the cosmos and our, our, our physical reality here um, is part of that symbolism. Yeah, the rays of the sun symbolized by the points and the crown, big yep. time. Yeah, one of the wildest versions of the crown in in the symbolism out there is of Kronos and Rhea and other gods and goddesses that are really just symbolic of Saturn and Saturn's wife and their crown of fortresses, or they would call it a mural crown sometimes. But like literally, these gods would be depicted wearing a fortress or a castle on their head, and that was their crown. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's another thing too, is, um, you know, it's for another presentation where I'll kind of like merge the both where they're not so separated, but a lot of times you'll see, especially like more modern, not like this is this crown we're looking at now is a very ancient crown of, of you know, of Hindu. It's an ancient Hindu crown. I uh, think though that that fortress crown is depicting the connection between the technology of the, the yeah, scepter yes. and crown and the actual architecture. Yes, Resonance absolutely. Absolutely. They correspond. And that's what really got, gave it away to me in the beginning was noticing that why the fuck do these crowns look exactly like the top of these buildings? And you're sitting inside the building, sitting on a throne ground, you know, like with the spires and the crosses on top of that. I was like, they're exactly the fucking same. So you know, your body is the earth, right? And you put the crown on top, the crown is the building on the earth. So you build the resonant architecture on the body of the earth. And it's a correlation of, you know, you are the philosopher's stone. The earth is the philosopher's stone of the galaxy and to implant the important uh, esoteric, you know, art that is the architecture, the ark, you know, the ark of the covenant, right? The Noah's ark architecture. In an uh, arc of the sky, as in an like yeah. a, a degree of a radius of an angle. <laughs> Why not, man? Exactly, that's God right there in in the fullest extent, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, uh, this is all pretty far out stuff. Speaking of representatives of God with the crown, you ever looked at the Pope's crazy crowns that they've got? <laughs> yeah, bro. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> You're nuts. <laughs> I want this, so this is the, the papal tiara. It, the, the, each pope gets his own special version of the papal tiara made. I've looked at those a lot. They're like three layered egghead, super jewel gold crowns. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I quite have similar to this Hindu crown you're showing right here, oddly. Yeah. Not oddly enough, because Not I know that the whole Vatican yes. tradition is actually just coming from Hindustan exactly. originally. It, as is all in my opinion and this this may be shit on but whatever a lot of this might get shit on and i don't care but uh yeah it all comes from well okay i pretty sure that and these ties are kind of confusing but it goes egyptian then it goes hindu or indian or vedic so like the vedic is a very highly descriptive version of a precursor of like the true uh um you know e the true esoterica of the egypt and then the western version of it is like this really kind of whitewashed and watered down version of egyptian stuff but like i think to get the true meaning you have to look at the vedic text like to the true understanding of it everything comes from the vedic text in my opinion the certainly with them though i'm not saying you're wrong but a big problem with them is the conditions that those texts were written in and kept in was such that through the course of the thousands of years most of the thousands of years between whenever those scriptures originated and now those things had to be rewritten, hand transcribed, mm -hmm. recopied at least once every 10 years. That's terrible. And it's like literally a game of telephone across centuries. I'm pretty sure some shit is going to get changed. Oh, yeah, um, undoubtedly. Well, undoubtedly. What you're saying about the transmission, I really, um, I've found a lot of, like, since taking it on as a perspective that's possible, I've seemed to see lots of reinforcing evidence w without being able to, like, presented right now that supports Michael Tessarion's idea that the knowledge originated from the Arctic homeland or Hyperborea or the extreme north 
whatever continent or thing mm-hmm. is going on at the North Pole. Yeah. Yes. And came to Ireland first, actually. Mm-hmm. Ireland, Iran, the Iroquois, these places, it disseminated out into the northern regions of the lands. And, and, and then Russia too, a lot. Yeah. A lot. Oh, yeah. Some, I've read the, um, uh, the we went the all North the way Wave. to the east, all the way to even to China. And then so it's hard to say, like, you know, some of them stopped in their migration in Egypt. Some stopped in Hindustan hard, or India, Ethiopia. It was as it was known at the time, Ethiopia, which is a word meaning like a black land, very much the same exact meaning as Kemet, which is mm-hmm. Egypt. So like where, where was first? It was almost like a moot point because it seems like there's a, this orig- original migration from west to east, but then our migration back from east to west. Tell you, it ends up being the Druids at the end of the line of the transmission before they get genocided, if they were. Yeah, if they were, if they didn't just transcend into the into the Borea. Borea itself, bore, right? Bore means to dig or, or to dig like a boar beetle. And but Borea itself is like this fringe area of a magnetic field, too. That's what it means in like modern science. And so I I've read a re- really great book. It's it's called Beyond the North Wind, and it fucking blew my mind on on Hyperborea. Um, I can't remember the author's name, but it's it's absolutely fantastic. Like I, I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, it just is so good. And we, I was reading it around the same time as we were doing our Atlantis Lemuria month on the show, and you know, we had so many great guests on come and and you know be a part of that month that. And just, I, I just learned so much, but I, I think that I think more, I think Lemuria and Hyperborea were almost either, you know, brother, sister lands or brother, sister cultures. And I'm not sure because, uh, B and L, uh, in, uh, oh no, that's B and M in Hebrew. My bad. Uh, apologies. No, I'm not, I'm not going to talk anymore on that. That's, that's really out of my wheelhouse, but I absolutely d- definitely dig with Hyperborea. And I think if they did exist, um, they were the, probably the, the, um, the star city, star fort kind of building culture. And they were super hard, uh, highly resonating and, and were, you know, major physicists, scientists, possibly some of the curators of the secret esoteric sciences that we have today. Obviously, if they're the originating culture, that they would be that. Um, and you know, and if my, they're coming from an age more like Age of Aries, or maybe just right before it, Taurus, possibly, but probably Age of Aries. They, I would assume, had a philosophy of their culture that a stronger culture would be the one that as many people had the knowledge as possible, and they knew as much about yeah. what made the culture work as possible. Yeah. Instead of this compartmentalized everything through a strainer game of telephone that we got in the Age of Delusion, Tower of Babel time. Because that obviously weakens the civilization. You can't have it. No empire even lasts very long in that configuration. And so, yeah, once the age of Pisces comes to water, you know, to wash away all the information, to wash away, you know, and to create it, create some sort of either cosmic flood or real flood or whatever. Mud flood too. Uh, all of the above, I think. Too. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. And that's something too. I kind of wanted to. Don't know that's another side tangent, but I think that what happened was the earth grew. And it was I'm like it finished the cycle. It, it, it grew, and so yeah. it wasn't like somebody did it to the earth. It was just what happens. So talking about the um, electric universe theory, uh, you know, and growing Earth theory, and you know, all of these things kind of like wrapped into one. Uh, the, the cosmology of the Saturnian cosmology, when the planets were closer together, I think if Earth was growing then it could have pushed away the planets and uh, Velikovsky, he describes, you know, the, uh, the reigns of Saturn where it wasn't rain, wasn't R E I G N S. It was R I I N S reigns, like actual the water coming from Saturn being pulled down. And that's, that's Emmanuel Velikovsky. He's got a book on that. Yeah. I, I see him as a bit of a encoder gatekeeper, like Fulcanelli type. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. It's, I, he's, and he was, you know, his passing, all these guys passings are so mysterious. It's like, where did they go? You know? Oh, you were, you died mysteriously at this place. 
Okay. Yeah, I can, I, I'm, I have a decent theory myself that kind of makes sense of the growing earth and the electric universe, but from a more of a almost center, almost synergizing flat and around earth in a way, but a flat plane that we're on within a spheroid egg, elliptical mm-hmm. egg shape. And that the, uh, like a hermetically sealed container, you know, almost like our realm is trying to grow the homunculus of a God <laughs> through all the cells of these individual beings. But that at the point where you need to recharge the battery that this thing is, that would represent like an electrolysis process. And when you do electrolysis on devices that we can build today, it generates sludge, water and sludge and mud. So maybe at the point where the battery ran out and it needed a recharge, that's how the earth also grows and more matter gets added to the system. I don't know. That's as quick of a, as a brief (laughs) summary as I can give of the idea without (laughs) taking way too long and taking us way too far away from our, (laughs) where we're at. We're actually hitting close to the first hour mark. Um, Oh shit. Okay. Feels like we might not be able to do this in two hours and we can go long if you've got the time. So it's up to you. Do you want to, wrap up for the free hour here or is there a point that you'd like to push a little further to before let's, we hit the, uh, the break point let's get to through the crowns really quick i can I bust think through that's the a crowns. good idea okay because then we got two other you know we then we got the other tools that we're going to enter in uh and then more art so i'll finish up the crowns yeah that sounds great i forgot about the <clears throat> the hour mark my apologies brother we've been oh no you're good tangenting on a bunch of, of other conversations it's too good to get into the tangents because we both <laughs> really love what we're talking about <laughs> it's so true um okay let's go so there's so much to say about the crown uh one of my interpretations uh is to be crowned king is to be crowning right when you get crowned you're crowned king you're crowning it's a cosmic birth or a transmutation the initiation that's what the anointing is um <clears throat> in alchemy the crow the crow is depicted generally during the putrefaction uh, the perfect putrefaction is a crow's head or the ashes of the Hermes tree. And this process is generally the first step. It could take up to a year by some standards, which to me symbolizes the crowning of the birth cycle. Um, but yeah, you see the word crow in crown, right? So alchemically speaking, this is the first piece of uh, antiquated transhumanist tool uh, uh, or jewelry that you'll get to to show that you're starting your putrefaction, you're starting your separation. Um, that's the crow. Um, you're I'm really on to something. Let me just drop a little extra fuel on that crow crown fire. Yes, yes. You're totally on it. The Latin word for crow is corvus. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So then you have the Latin termination US, which becomes OS when you switch to Greek. And if you're also going from Latin to Greek, the N in Greek looks like the Latin V. So now your Corvus becomes Cornus, but the uh, <laughs> OR can easily be an RO, especially when we're talking about these priest class that know Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and Hebrew goes the other way. So OR is also an, a radical referring to the sun or God. So anyway, very, very small phonetic shifts take you from Corvus to Cronus. Well, this is going to show us here, this slide, this is some root language kind of referencing what you were just talking about too. Oh, nice. Um, So we got some root language here for the word crown. According to Watkins, this is from a suffix form of Proto-Indo-European root word skr, S-K-E-R. Don't ask me how, this is just what the etymologists say, but uh, to turn or bend. But Beeks considers the crown sense derived from the formerly identical Greek word karoni, K-R-O-N-E, or crow, which he says was used metaphorically as all kinds of curved or hooked formed objects. Moreover, he writes, the metaphorical use of karoni or crow uh, is nothing remarkable given its use of cognates. The metaphors that have been originated from the shape of a beak or the claws of a bird compare Latin corax or crow, also a hooked engine of war, French corbeau, raven, also cantilever, um, the English crowbar. Old English. Think about a scythe, man. Scythe, skur, scythe, a hooked hooked curved thing. 
it's ex- this, that's what Cronus other time de- de- exactly Cronus Cronus the crowning yeah exactly the the ra- dude you got it uh old english use corona directly from latin figuratively it's regal power that's from the 12 uh 1200 from the late 14th century is a crowning honor or distinction um or the top part of the skull or the head or top of a hat top part of a tooth which appears above the gum but that's something else so skirt well, uh, there's something to that but we'll leave it <laughs> <laughs> oh oh interesting uh, on the two stuff well, I mean, yeah, your teeth cut, first of all, but that would need us to take a divergence into the Hebrew word for tooth. But yeah, let's, let's continue this. Okay, we'll continue this. This is just more, you guys can look up all of this stuff, look up, you know, uh, etymology of the word crowns. Here's just a couple examples of some like, uh, uh, um, of like crowns and, and these types of technologies being used in the Bible. Um, he puts a jewel upon thy nose and earrings in thine ears and a crown of adornment upon thine head. It's from Ezekiel 1612. The subject here treated is of the setting up of the church. A jewel upon the nose denotes of the perception of good earrings and the ears denote the perception of truth and obedience. A crown upon the head denotes the wisdom thence derived. Um, yeah, the other ones are eh. So now we're just going to go into kind of like a history of each little region and some of their crowns and and stuff. Like, look at this guy, dude. Like, what an OG. What an OG. Look at these spires. Spires on the head, yeah. Man, like, what? Definitely making me think of that whole Cronus being the god of fortresses and having a crown that looked like a fortress. Yeah, and exactly. And that's like the time machine, right? It's like a time machine is the building itself, uh, is, is, is father times building. And so inside the, inside the machine, you're able to, so this is the Albanian crown, dude, this thing is epic. It might not look that epic, but I have a little description of like what it's made of here. So Skanderberg's helmet is made of white metal adorned with a strip dressed in gold. And on its top lies the head of a horned goat made of bronze, also dressed in gold. The bottom part bears a copper strip adorned with a monogram separated by rosettes. Like, See, and there you can tell that that Albanian crown is still not that different than the other religions of the Sky Father uh, in other places of the world. Because look Amon, at Aries. Right, it's the Aries ram, ram horns, but it's just a, as a goat. But like you have in Egypt, uh, Ra Amon or Amon Ra was symbolized as the most high version of the sun. The sun had different names as it went through different parts of the day. And at the noon, the most high, the, where the shadows are no longer visible, is Amon, Amon Ra, Amon meaning the hidden one. But Amon Ra had the ram horns depicted on his head in, mm-hmm. in the crown. Mm-hmm. And that becomes Jupiter or Zeus Amon. Zeus is shown with the very same thing. Moses has got horns when he's shown. Moses, the initiate. Moses is just another, I say just, but he is definitely another archetype of this same exact sky father, Jesus, Mercury, whoever you want to call him, motif. So <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting. Um, those are definitely um, Amonian horns on that crown. Yeah. Just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, cool. Wow, that that's a whole other uh, envelope of things I didn't even really uh, realize. Showing um, it just demonstrates that the same cult is behind all of the the rulers, royal houses, and exactly the, of exactly. the parts of the world that seem different. That's what. That's why I want to get with you and, and start doing some deeper research on this. We could write a fucking sick book, you and I, bro. I, I promise. Yeah, um, we okay. could. <laughs> In Albanian mythology, the physical phenomenon, elements, and objects are attributed to supernatural beings. The deities are generally not persons, but personifications of nature, which is known as animism. The earliest attested cult of the Albanians is the worship of the sun and the moon. In Albanian folk beliefs, earth is the object of a special cult. And an important role is played by fire, which is considered a living, sacred, or divine element used for ritual, sacrificial offerings, and putrefaction. 
or sorry, purification. Uh, same thing. Uh, fire worship is associated with the cult of the sun, the cult of the hearth, and the cult of fertility in agriculture and animal husbandry. Besa is a common practice in Albanian culture, consisting of an oath taken by sun, by moon, by sky, by earth, by fire, by stone, by mountain, by water, and by snake, which are all considered sacred objects. All of cult those of are the primary, literally, you just listed every primary symbol of the the cult that reaches across the world secretly. Yeah. All the yeah. primary symbols right there. Yep. And that's, it's all alchemical too. Uh, Cause those can be, you know, gold, silver, uh, uh, salt, you know, fire, uh, mercury, all, all that shit, dude. So stuff is deep guys. It's deep y'all. Um, here's a crown. <laughs> Got a lot of these pictures just like i just think they're beautiful so we're just going through it like you can't really see but there's this is gold and there's there's literal carvings on it here now just, i'm also thinking of albanians i'm like what does that name mean and uh other than the white like albedo process of alchemy yeah you have so there's a it's very easy to do a phonetic switch to a different aspirate from alb to alp or even alt but definitely mm -hmm. alp i mean p mm -hmm. and b are the same letter Mm -hmm. just flipped upside down so alp is hebrew meaning one taught as in a disciple and it's very close one add one vowel in and you got the aleph which is there's your bull god but oh so anyway then the albanians bull? it seems like that name is like those who are taught or disciples of of this thing of this mysterious initiated wow This one is not impressive, but uh, you there? It's pretty impressive. Oh, sorry. Is it? Is it? it looks like uh, this one is. I don't like have a crown like that. This Swedish crown is still pretty good. No hate, uh, Swedes. No, no, I love the Swedes. Love the Swedes. But th <laughs> what what I did think is uh, interesting. There's when they started implementing these fabric pieces here. So the fabric can be honestly an incredible, incredible, important piece. Uh, and I'll, we'll get into that here in a little bit. Look at this queen right here. This is in Germany. Just oh, Ukrainian. Look at this picture. Love it, guys. Oh, okay. there's your temp <laughs> there's your Templar Knights of Malta cross on the Ukrainian crown before. The oh yeah, that's incredibly Templar. Templar one, two, three, four. Oh, and yeah, you got the three horns. Like whatever direction you're looking at it, you have the three prongs, the three horns. That is the fleur de lis. That is the, like the, I mean, I'll just stop there, but you could dig into the symbolism of the three points or the three uh, horns, not the ram horns symbol, but the three points on any direction that you're looking at a crown that has major significance to the same cult too. Yes. That's what Without I mean. Like the, the, every single country has these Royal crowns and they're all around the same period of time. So, you know, what we don't know is is who or when or why why it started, or maybe someone does. And if they need to fucking get us get to us ASAP, uh, and and send me the literature because I I'm I'm ready. You know. Uh, also, Ukrainian flower headdresses. Look how beautiful these are. I love these. Not relevant, but cool. Oh, uh, cool. <laughs> saint Ol Olga of Kiev is Ukraine's patron saint of defiance and vengeance. Look at her. Does she look like po a politic or does she look like she's about to cast some sweet spells on you? Female Illuminati all day. Yeah, go. Yeah, the true, the true, uh, the deemsters and seamsters of the, of the, uh, of the scene. Okay. Now we're looking at some Portuguese crowns. Very yeah. Cool. Yep. Yep. Very yeah, octopusy forget. on this one. Forget that we're, uh, also, oh yeah, it is, huh? Look at that. Those that actually I think is representative of an octopus. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, man. I think yeah. so. Wow. Uh absolutely. What what I mean, a Portuguese trip. were all uh, seafaring people. So yeah, at, absolutely at the time of their height of their power. So I think so. Uh one other thing I want to mention too is that I kind of forgot, but uh there's this is either this is the globus cruciger which is one of the three tools that we're going to talk about today it's on the top of mostly all of these crowns right i mean this bird is also a symbolization of a cross as well um got the ball the cross 
the ball yeah, it's across. Been on a few of them that we've it's, looked at at least have been noticed exactly that. exactly so i will get to that that's towards the end. all the way back to egypt and earlier that symbol Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a big one. And also when uh, the it's the earth symbol, like uh, or the Atlantean cross in the circle um, is, a, is another symbol for the 33 or the cru- cru- uh, globus cruciger. In Nepal, certain crowns possess an esoteric power when held in the hands or worn on the head of the initiated tantric priest. Such objects are potent symbols of esoteric Buddhism of Nepal and enshrine the status of tantric specialist in Nepalese Buddhist society. The act of wearing such a crown plays an essential role in the construction of visual manifestation of power. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that one, dude. Like, what? That was epic. They don't make them like that anymore. That's absolutely right. And they're, they don't, you know, these things aren't worn in battle. Despite what, you know, some terrible like history movies want us to believe. These things were worn in the resonant architecture during practices to have vibrational uh, overloads, basically. Look at this Indian crown. This is one of my favorites. Yeah, man. And uh, this is a tangent. And I don't think I can, I think I can say it briefly, but, <laughs> you know, the, in, in the ritual, whenever you would do whatever it was to invoke the God or whatever channel a God and you like, they treat you like you really were that God for the time. So putting this stuff on in the resonance architecture with the symbols of a particular God of fire, sun, God thing going on, you bet that at some point, some culture or many of them were like literally talking to some being through the mouth of whatever that used to be their guy that they call King. Yeah, I and like I said in the very beginning, I believe was um, uh, to to vibrate with the gods like a god. It's you know you like you said you're just you're transmuting yourself into that realm, and the more that people egregorically post you up on that pedestal, you know the easier it is for you to go there and stay there. Um, this is the Indian crown. From you know, obviously, for like a Vedic crown, and and it has the homage of the uh, um, uh, the Deshet, you know, the uh, Egyptian like hands, the Deshet Egyptian crown, crown, Egypt, yeah, yeah, exactly, just like because the snakes coming out of the, the third Uraeus eye thing, yeah, the hooded, yeah. Cobra, hooded cobra thing, yes, exactly. Like this is probably one of my favorite crowns. It's so epic. It even has like the sun behind it, right? Like a lot of times in just straight biblical text, you see the sun halo behind the head. This is where it comes from. I mean, that this is predating Christianity, you know? Uh, you mean before we call it Christianity because it was Krishna anity there, same Krishna, exact thing. Exactly. Christ, Krishna, Krishna in Hinduism yes. refers to blackness, blackened. Mm-hmm. The black god and, they worship, and I don't mean African or skin color. It's well, the crow, yeah. it's the putrefaction. It's the coron, cornu, corvus, corona. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> too, too brother. Much to get into, but it is like, so much. All this so- crown symbolism confirms it. This is exactly. Thank you so much. You're so right. Yeah. And I forget that too with the, the Krishna, but yeah, like, like Fulconelli describes and other people. And what we know is that the original cathedrals were built on top of, you know, these, these tombs of ISIS. And, but under there, they have the, you know, the black Madonnas, um, which is, you know, correlated to either it, it started, it was ISIS, but now it's, it's Madonna or then Mary. Um, but either way, it's the same thing. So, the, here's another piece of just art just to like just you know rubbing it in our faces it has exoteric and esotericness to it um he's got the crown he's got he's got the 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 longer staff here which has got these balls anytime you see these balls on here these are filled right with mercury probably or some sort of salt solution probably that, red mercury yeah and uh this is the hand of justice over here uh and some of the symbolism you know like of of exoteric and esoteric is exactly that you know he's got that hand, one hand up the one hand down he's got the two different color robes on he's got the one foot in the front one foot in the back this is like showing us that there's an esoteric meaning 
going on here and what do you see you see scepters you see these things on the ground there's an esoteric meaning to these an esoteric meaning to the crown he is vibrating one with god he's looking at him he's just vibing dude like straight feeling it uh you know you got yeah you got all the fleurs in the back here and, and all this stuff it's this is french as fuck and like the fleur de lis is, french. is absolutely a symbol of the crown like not of yes Royalty specifically, but of the crown itself, the physical crown, the fleur de lis symbolizes that. It's so cool. I, I didn't actually really ever put it through like that, but now that you say that, this is kind of all just highlighting the crown and the exoteric and the esotericness of it. The exoteric is political power, pa you know, yay, we're royal family, power, power, power. The esoteric is God, science, physics, consciousness frequency resonance you know like the lifting the veil alchemy you know uh here we go here the deshret uh just to show you guys you know if you didn't already know which i'm sure you have because your listeners are obviously amazing uh they are they are yeah obviously <laughs> deshret crown of lower egypt represents the masses the color being ruddy or red or brown yeah. is also symbolic symbolized in egyptian hieroglyphs by the donkey so it's the crown of rulership over the masses symbolized by asses the masses of asses <laughs> hello i'm still here oh <laughs> hello you just, i, I thought just stopped going that was the end of the weave on that <laughs> i don't want to oh, okay. i don't want to hijack too much i just like to point that oh, no. out the mass and the ass Oh, I love that. Yeah, then this is the head jet. You know, they're basically kind of correlating a little bit of the exo and esotericness of it, but um, also it's all alchemy. It's all alchemy. The red, the white, and then the marriage of the two. Uh, you got the tendril coming here with the shent, right? I love the tendrils, man. The Isn't tendrils it funny are also too that beard. they refer to dumb people or unlearned people as an ass hat. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, yeah, I'm glad you brought this, this up. Toilet? Combine the deshret and headjet. It's called the skint. Yeah, a cool word. Yeah, right. Scent, which means like ps, you know, like psychedelic or whatever. It's very close to scent. And like scent, scent, scent senses. Scent is senses. also yes. money. You know, yeah. The, the royals are coining. Coin is very etymologically related to king, actually. Coin, queen, Cohen meaning priest in the Hebrew. It's all, it's all there. Yeah. For yeah. Those with the it, eyes to see. It, exactly. It's not even hidden. It is there for the, with those with the eyes to see those that are uh, beautiful enough in their, in their hearts and their, in their souls to, to be curious. And this is another piece of beautiful art you know, just kind of showing that these things have always been with us and we're only now living in a time when it's not. This is supposedly the oldest crown that we have ever found in a cave. Um, very old. I mean, I, I, can't, I, I think I have the article somewhere, but it's made of copper and they cleaned it up quite a bit. And this obviously is talismanic, right? Oh, I do have it. 3500 BC. E BC. Um, it was, yeah, it was found in a, a cave in the Dead Sea, which obviously makes sense. But yeah, it's talismanic, brother. I mean, look at it, you know, like these eight dots. You have these port, like portal winds here. And yeah, the understanding of consciousness goes way further back than we've ever been told. These were also found in that same cave. Thought that was pretty cool. Interesting too, how there is all black, blackened. Well, it's copper, so it's tarnished. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's tarnished it, and then they clean. Obviously, they cleaned it up a lot for this one, because that's it's the same crown, but they just like they polished it up. Because copper has that really beautiful quality where it'll. Oh shit! <laughs> I have uh, hyperlinks in some of these, so. Um yeah you know some african royal wearing this what you would think like this is, looks like just like straight european you know but they yeah, I mean, same with the hawaiian royal family 
Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, here you go. You know, art, love it. Oh, shit, I went backwards. There's, here's the bear or the uh, the lion or bear. Could be, could be the bear, could be a lion. It's like, must complete the mission, get the rest of the tools to transcend the consciousness. <laughs> Um, and, uh, real quick before we sign off for the hour, just want to, we're almost wrapping up here on the crown stuff. Let's, let's talk turbans and the history of turbans also ties into this whole history. Uh, it's very important. Um, the method of the turban uh, of wearing a turban helps in acclimation uh, of the waves of the body. E easiest and simple satvik method is to wrap a towel or a washcloth in a rounded manner around the head. Satvik vibrations of the universe congregate in the void, creating in the middle of the turban. The arrangement of the turban helps in augmentation of the satvik vibrations within the body. The contact of the turban helps in development of pure intellect. The pattern on the head created by the way the turban is tied is extremely set veek. This is because the vibrations that congregate in the turbans, turban's round shape are associated with uh, jinyan shakti, the energy of knowledge, and hence contact with the turban helps in the development of pure intellect within the individual. Multiple folds in the turban increase the proportion of congregation of vibrations of the Dian Shakti, since Marak, the destroyer, as well as Tarak, the savior, waves congregate in the turbans as per the need the individual benefits according to its constitution. The turban increases the presence of the Kari Shakti, the energy of action in the body. When the presence of the Kari Shakti in the body is to be increased, one of the turban is left hanging at the back. The contact of the turban cloth with the vertebrae helps in keeping the uh, central channel of the spiritual energy flow system, which extends from the base of the spine to the top of the head in an awakened state. Subtle waves of the divine principle are imbibed, uh, imbibed by the turban due to which the individual's gross body, mental body, casual body, and super super casual body are purified. The subtlest waves of the superior deities presented in the universe are attracted toward the turban and through the notional opening situated at the crown of the head, which leads to the re uh, realization of Brahman and Shiv of the individual and they spread all over the body of the individual and get activated. Similarly, because of the turban, subtle waves and principles of deities are set veek um, and Chaitanya bestowing are imbibed. This leads to the purification of the individual's gross body, mental body, casual body, and super casual body, uh, super, sorry, super casual body, are purified and then become said veek and are enriched. Uh, this in turn reduces the individual's ego. Such an individual performs virtuous task effortlessly and individual's bhav is above 30%. The deities function through it. Okay, that gives us a, uh, a kind of like, um, yeah, it kind of gives us a, a, a history of this why we might use something on our head, you know, coming back from the Vedic text and then thus, you know, spanning through the alchemical understandings and then tying more uh, alchemical symbology to it and, and alchemical practices. But if just, you know, just by wearing a towel on your head um, allows you to communicate through these different, uh, these deities through the waves of the electrical universe, man, they are electrical consciousness. That's uh, really interesting in the etymology of some of the, or just the phonetics, I guess, of some of the words involved there. Like, uh, uh, I could probably go in on that for a minute, but because we're so deep into the hour, I won't. I'll just say, I'll just point out a couple of them to you. The, uh, the good vibes are the tarak. Makes yeah. you think of tar tars. The savior oh. vibe that you're bringing in is the tar. Uh-huh. Right. And also, <laughs> I actually think the old Nintendo 64 game, Turok the Dinosaur Hunter. He was I like was the just, that's what I, that's what I automatically <laughs> went to. Yeah. But the, bad, the bad vibes and the destruct, destructive vibes are Marok, 
So the previous age, the good high Ram age, if you will, Tar, yeah. Taria, they call it, Marok, yeah. Mar, Maria, the sea, the ocean, the deluge, the Pisces age. Not saying that like Maria or Mary is an evil symbol, but it is representative of the sea. And, you know, we can't we yeah, can leave that I into mean, what we were saying earlier without too much more meaning to say too much more. Yeah, the mar it's, and the I mean, tar. That's, that's deep. That's deep. The mar, mar and the tar. tar, actually. I'm going to have to write that one down in my notes so I can actually go back on that because that's actually Just think about the word martyr. You, the, the, oh. the killing mar of the tar. Of the, the good. Mar of the tar. tar. The video killed the radio star. <laughs> mar to the video killed the mar tar. Wow. Anyways. Okay, so we'll wrap up <laughs> this first hour here, dude. This has been quite a ride quite a ride and there's more to go all right so uh let people know where they can find you and if you have any closing thoughts for the free hour people or maybe to entice them to continue onward into my patreon or rockman uh, but definitely let them know where they can find you and what you're doing and what you're excited about all that stuff Oh man. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, if you, if you want to follow along with the presentation, I highly recommend you just go on over and sign up. And plus also let's not forget that chance has on banging ass guest all the time. And you know, he's an OG in the scene, so I'm grateful to be here, but if you're not already signed up for that, I mean, you're, you're going to be soon. Let's just put it that way. Anyways, uh, as for, um, for understanding, I, chemical stuff or, or you know i hope that we kind of opened a, a door for you guys to to travel within the alchemical realms ourselves because it's our it is our right and i think it's it's everybody has a past life or, or some sort of energy tied to a chemical processes and no matter where you are in your journey you have a you have a piece of the puzzle that will help crack the cosmic code and and that's what um that's what alchemy is it's a cosmic code it's an intuition and uh so you know i i'm over at rising from the ashes we do themed months uh and and we we do a lot of history stuff so this month this past two months actually we were doing ancient americas uh we have a lot of great episodes out for that and then we're doing uh next month for june we got like this kind of like it's kind of like esoteric America. So we're going like the esoteric architecture. So like Chad Stoom keys coming on, talk about uh, the Stargate portal from Detroit with Michael Wan and Ross Ben, those guys and doing that kind of layout stuff. And then later in the summer, we're doing Sumer summer, Egypt and, and just ancient history going back to the roots of RFTA a little bit. Other than that, you know, uh, yeah you guys are awesome i mean like check it out you know just this is this is a working work for everybody come check out the telegram jump on interverse and rising from the ashes telegram fucking shit is awesome out there like the, the community of weavers is just like next level so you know i hope to see you guys out there and uh and let us know what you think of the presentation beautiful man you Totally rule. This has been awesome. You deserve a crown, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, dude. I love one. Fuck yeah. Can't I got wait one to have times. future collabs and also finish out this amazing presentation you've got for us. Like I, I've made connections I hadn't made before from you bringing this forward. So big appreciation, big, big love. You the man. And uh, we'll see everybody on the other side. Cheers.
uh, wow, <laughs> absolutely incredible. I feel like I've been visited by the homie Romy fairy that just twinkled some magic dust and opened our eyes to a whole huge realm of possibilities that were always there, but we just didn't see. As much as I had to say about many aspects of his presentation, I learned way more than I dished out in this whole thing. I am so happy that I got to play host to his 97 slides on this topic. And it was really just like half of the equation. So, wow. Um, antiquated transhumanism. I'm feeling like that's what I should talk about here in the outro as a concept, because even though that was the thrust of the presentation, a lot of that idea was kind of in the implication. And we were looking at the implements themselves and not necessarily tying it all together into being like, okay, this is how it ties into the idea of antiquated transhumanism. So I'm going to do my best to give some tying up of that idea, wrapping it up. I mean, Romy did go there well in the second hour in the plus extension, but especially if you just heard the free hour and we finished off on crowns, even though you got an hour and a half instead of a normal one hour of the show. And I think the second out, the second half was about the same, about an hour and a half. Wow. That's two in recent episodes where we went three hours instead of two hours. So we welcome. I hope that's okay. <laughs> I liked it. It's amazing. So, right, right. So we wrapped up with crowns in the end of hour one and I had a lot to say about them, but we didn't quite go fully there with what is he talking about? Antiquated transhumanism. Amazingly, the other three hour show recently was Wayne McCroy, who is the transhumanism guy. He's really adept at explaining the whole alchemy of that cybernetics thing. So to go from modern transhumanism, which is all about this technological cloud of artificial connection, I guess you could say, to the antiquated version, what is different about the antiquated version? And then maybe, so the question I have here is, is it bad or is it sinister in a way? Because obviously in terms of a control methodology, the modern version is quite sinister. Maybe not everybody that is a proponent, proponent, <laughs> proponent of transhumanism is themselves like ill-intentioned, but generally the entire science of cybernetics is about control, control, control. And thus squeezing out the spark of individuality from the, you know, the people who are under this net, this cyber net. But the idea of the antiquated version, putting on this crown and connecting with the most high energetically, maybe even bringing forth into yourself, like invoking the qualities of a particular deity could be, or an angel, you could call it an angle drawn on those obscure odd angles for sure. You know, that maybe in and of itself, we, we look at that and we're like, okay, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And the exclusivity of it as well makes it seem kind of like, well, that's not fair. How come Jim Bob doesn't get to wear the crown? Well, <laughs> Not everybody comes into an incarnation with the intention of working on themselves and becoming a philosopher and purifying their heart, body, spirit, right? I'm not saying that I know who or how you could judge the worthiness of that, but maybe in a more pure version, the ancient mysteries and the initiations of those mysteries were designed to be sort of like gateways to for the, only the authentically purified seeker to pass through that gateway. I don't know. I ask that question because I've been learning more about ancient Egypt with Howdy McCoskey's book, The Power of Then. And he brought to mind the idea that some cultures, I think the Mayans were amongst them and the early, early ancient Egyptians as well, that the ruling class, if you can call it a class in this setup, they to receive the ability to be in charge as a mediator or a ruler, if you will, or a judge, you had to do an oath where you gave away all your property and you couldn't own anything anymore. And you became fully at the mercy of the, the temple. And the temple is what fed you and gave you a place to live and all that. So, you know, that doesn't sound very appealing, which means to get into the position of power, you have to give up 
all the trappings of what we consider being related to power in the first place in terms of political authority today. And uh, theoretically, in a config like that, where you couldn't own property as the ruler or the judge, makes you kind of difficult to corrupt if you can't be bribed because you aren't allowed to own anything to begin with. So obviously that is not the case when we're looking at kings like the kings of England and France and Portugal and all that, where they like literally they own everything. So that idea is out the window, but maybe the technology that they're using, you know, because this idea of the crown, it does hail from Egypt. And before we got into those crowns, the, the, uh, the skint, if you will, the upper crown, Egypt, upper, upper Egypt crown, lower Egypt crown, all that good stuff. Maybe that technology did fall into the hands of lesser men, if you will, little men who wanted, had little man syndrome and wanted to own it all and be the big man. But perhaps it is a relic of a bygone age where this was done more healthily. You know, the right vessel was chosen to be taking in the power of the God or the gods and channeling that. I don't know. It seems very silly when you look back at what we're told by Egyptologists that they tell us, uh, yes, those people believe the Pharaoh was literally a God or the Pharaoh was God. That is silly. Yes, indeed. And then the following ideas of the Middle Ages, like the divine right of kings, like your king because God said so, also quite difficult to swallow. But maybe they didn't believe that the Pharaoh was God or a God. Maybe the Pharaoh channel a God or gods. And even that is tricky because as Howdy depicts the ancient Egyptians in their best light in the earlier times before they fell to idolatry, you could say that they didn't believe in multiple gods as actual deities, so so to say, more that the Neturu or were aspects of nature, Netur nature. And that (laughs) there's your net cyber Neturu. (laughs) That would be a cool name for a band, but that they as representatives symbolically of aspects of nature, you could tap in to the symbolism of a particular God or goddess to connect with that particular aspect of nature or natural power, whatever that might be like healing a God or goddess of healing. You might have that God or goddess representing healing in a statue and you can touch the statue and get healed by that. Very interesting concept. So I'm kind of getting into some rambles, but the old version of transhumanism is very different because the cloud that you maybe have been connecting into is more like the actual universal ether, the Akashic becoming all knowing in that way, rather than going through this sort of inverted, highly controlled version of gnosis through the internet, right? Where the internet, yeah, you can become all knowing if you could connect your consciousness to the internet. But what would you be all all know all knowledgeable about? Uh, comic books, <laughs> sports ball, Wikipedia. You can know all of that, but all that trivia is trivial and related to artificial things to begin with. Whereas the akashic or the universal ether, that maybe the antiquated version of transhumanism was trying to connect up to and get a cloud link to download and upload through was the real existence, the, act, the actuality, the reality of what really happened and is happening on Earth right now. I don't know. That's my best way to explain it. Can't say if it's good or bad. Probably not wise to draw such judgments and instead try to understand what it was doing functionally. And then maybe you can have instances like, okay, it was misused here, but it was used well here. But first we need to understand what it is and how they're using it to begin with. Right. So a lot more to explore with all this amazing perspective that Romy brought forward. Really loving it. Okay. So this is a good time to talk about the plus extension, the second hour and a half available on my Rockfin or my Patreon. You can get access to that and all the extended episodes I've ever put out through one or the other Rockfin or Patreon. It's really a matter of preference in terms of the interface and what you're trying to uh, access. The Rockfin side, you get everybody's content that has premium content on the whole network for 10 per month. And on the Patreon side, you get just my stuff for five a month, which I think is a great deal. Because when you think about it, it's like getting 
uh, an extra hour plus every week for $1 a week, pretty much. So like I'm doing all this work over here and I'm asking you to give me a dollar a week. <laughs> you tip servers way more than that, right? And uh, I feel like I'm probably doing quite a bit more specialized and nuanced of, of creation than a server. No offense to any servers out there. I've been one. But I, so I feel like that's why I'm qualified to say so. <laughs> this is more, more niche, more unique. You're not going to find me anywhere but here, right? Speaking of uh, the second hour, we talked about dowsing rods or divining rods. And that was a huge chunk of like 30 minutes on that. The history of them, the, the mechanics of them, what people have thought about them, maybe varieties of them. What was interesting was talking about the possibilities of much more effective dowsing or divining methods hidden by initiates and alchemists behind just the basic concept of the forked branch. Very interesting. And I know that <laughs> I'm not going to be telling you a lot about revealing a lot about the second hour and a half, but suffice to say, it involved scepters, swords, globus crucigers, alchemical bells, and magical talismans, all in the same quality and level of analysis as what we were talking about with the crowns. So if you want to go further and look at more of possible aspects of this trinity of technological artifacts that maybe were required to tap in to this antiquated version of transhumanism, get in there and join Join plus, interverse plus, and transhumanism, trans -ism. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. There's so many things in that conversation, too, in terms of word gravy that were ridiculous. And I even had to hold back quite a bit of it. I just want to tell you guys that a lot of the etymological decodes that I've been popping out lately, I mean, I read a lot of books, but the best book series or my favorite has been for a long time, the spirit world book series by Dylan Sicosio. The third book in that series, you can actually get as an audio book narrated by me. There's a link to that in the show notes, but he recently put out book four, a God's acre for winds of the soul spirit world, W H I R L E D world. So uh, check that out. Dylan Sicosio is an amazing author and I'm only three not even three chapters complete in this book and was able to make a lot of connections in this conversation with homie Romy based on stuff I learned in those just couple, two and a half chapters. So you want to learn the secret doctrines of the architect Tanishi, Mathematici, and Perfecti, the real Illuminati, the ancient church, and how everything that it's built off of this singular empire that has been lost or forgotten or hidden. It's a good book to get into. Spirit World, really helpful. I would read it if I was me, and I am. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to play this out. I don't know what song yet, but I asked Homie Romy to send me some music because he makes music. We didn't even talk about that. It was just all in the research and all in the gravy, but like Romy would be good for a chat of just a general talk about anything and his life and who he is because he's so stoked on life. Such a beautiful, poetic soul. Really love that guy. And I hope you do check out Rising from the Ashes, his show with Dan and Aki Dan, where he's a co-host. They're doing great things over there. He's putting in the work, putting in the research, putting in the work. Definitely worth following. Right. So I'm going to play this out with some of his music. He's a great producer and I hope you enjoy it. If you want to get in touch with me for sound healing, vibrational medicine that I do remotely, where you're interested in finding out more, check the show notes for a link to interversepodcast.com slash sound dash healing, or shoot me an email chance at interversepodcast.com. I'm also here for you. If you want some counseling on the spiritual side, I like to do that using tarot cards and I Ching and a couple of Oracle decks and help the universe provide you with the divinely inspired message, help you see yourself as clearly as you need to in that moment. Would love to do some fun connecting together on the healing journey for you out there. So get in touch. Would love to hear from you. Join our telegram. That's where the party's at. The community is totally vibing all the time, 24 seven, amazing knowledge being shared. 
And if you're not catching our Vibrant episodes live, why don't you join us on 8 p.m. Central for Vibrant on my YouTube or my Rockfin? It's cool to catch a replay, but join us live and interact with the amazing chat. I think it's really fun. It's my favorite night of the week. Okay, so yeah, we're going to play us out with this track by Homie Romy, whatever it is. Hope you enjoy. Thanks for tuning in. And I hope that uh, more of you guys caught this on the video side than normal since there was a lot of visual aspects to it all. And I will see you guys on the next show. Much love. Take care of yourself out there. Don't forget you are not only a vessel for source energy, you're literally source. I mean, that's what you are. You are the one consciousness of infinity experiencing itself as a petal on the infinitely petaled lotus mandala of existence that you are you never begin and you'll never end i'm not talking about your egoic self or your character logical identity I'm talking about what you really are tap into that originality learn to dance with life by making it up as you go it's beautiful <laughs> It's safe to make it up as you go. Actually, that's the preferred method of life, believe it or not. Okay, so yeah, be good out there. Take care of yourself. Love you all. Bye-bye.
Thank you.